I want to welcome you to Emotional Resilience, Living with the Fruit of the Spirit. I'm your host and author, Ron Ovett, and I'm so glad that you're here today with us. We're on session six. We're continuing our discussion on the brain, and today we're going to be talking about emotional dysregulation, or it could be called brain dysregulation, and neuroplasticity how the fact that the neuroplasticity can help change the things. That's the beautiful thing about our brain. Yeah, we used to think decades ago that, you know, the brain couldn't change. But then they started doing studies and find out more as they studied about the brain that indeed it can change. What is well-worn pathways, can you can create new ones, you can extinguish. We know today from working with stroke victims that part of the brain is dead, the, the activities that were going on can be picked up by other parts of the brain. It, God has created us in such a marvelous way, hasn't he? But today we want to talk about emotional dysregulation. Now that's the inability of a person to control or regulate their emotional responses to challenging situations. Doesn't that sound familiar? <laughs> That's why we're here, right? We're emotional creatures. And we're talking about emotional resilience, the ability to bounce back from those painful emotions, uh, those emotional reactions. And that's why it's so important to recognize when it's starting to happen. Uh, when we're dysregulating, right? And then we come back and we regulate it. And then our goal in this class, of course, is to what? Change those things that are bothering us in the first place. So often they're based on lies. So often they're based on things that we feel are true, but they aren't true. And we need to, what? Emotionally relearn what is true, right? And so we're talking about emotional dysregulation. The emotion is disproportionate to the circumstance, usually in the form of what? Crying or panic, anger, withdrawal, accusations, passive-aggressive behaviors, chaos, arguing, or even aggression. And so it should be obvious to us once we've done it. <laughs> and you'll find in the beginning of the class here that a lot of times we're going to learn how to regulate our emotions by going back, seeing sometime when we did uh, go uh, act disproportionately to the event, and we're going to recognize it there after the fact. And then I want to challenge you to meditate on what happened, to visualize what happened, to relax and visualize, and, and start seeing if you can relax even from the remembrance of it, right? And what could you have done different? How could you have caught it? What were the clues? Remember, in this class, you need to be your own detective, right? Right? You need to be your own detective. The game is afoot. You know, I love Sherlock Holmes, but uh, the fact is we need to be our own detective in these things. And so uh, it's easy sometimes to pick up when we have been in dysregulation after the fact. But sometimes, I'll be honest with you, we're even oblivious to that. Why? Because it's our normal. It's our normal. I came from a family that the loudest got heard, right? And we did some very sarcastic talking to each other, too. And when someone uh, joined our family through uh, a marriage and that, I remember them telling uh, my son, saying, boy, your family's kind of sarcastic, isn't it? And I remember uh, hearing that and thinking, boy, I got to change some of my ways. You know, we can be blind to some of the ways uh, that we dysregulate. And so it might help if you ask someone that knows you well, or if you really become a keen observer of yourself. And, and here again, ask God. You know, he says, let us ask him for wisdom. He'll give us wisdom if we ask him. And, we, and with wisdom, Proverbs says what? Get understanding. We want to know some of these things where we can work on them. And so... What we do is, you know, there's other types of dysregulation, not just those that are so obvious when we're with others. There's also that dysregulation when we're by ourselves. It could be depression, self-harm, heightened anxiety, panic attacks, addictions, right? I mean, these things are a form of dysregulation as well. And so, at this point, you need to be asking yourself, am I dysregulating? As I read this list, is there something I need to work on? And you can pray about it. You can say, Lord, help me. 
and you can submit yourself to this class and to what we're doing here for change. And if you're in a group, and I hope you are, together in a group you can help each other and work together. Now what are some of the signs of dysregulation? You might want to circle that on page one and, and look on them and meditate them because I, I encourage you, uh, when you come to this program, try to read the lesson ahead of time. Uh, hopefully, if, uh, if you're by yourself, you're getting in on our email. I try to send it out ahead of time. If you're in a class, you have the book. Uh, but I encourage you to read it ahead of time where you can be thinking about these things. Then you can watch what I'm doing here and then you can have a great discussion time. But some of the signs of emotional dysregulation are emotions that are too intense for the situation. It could be, you know, a person is not able to calm themselves. Maybe you're not able to calm yourself down. Or you're impulsive. You know, it's this impulsivity, right? Or it could be avoidant behavior. It could be de de difficulty in recognizing our own emotions. We're blinded to it, right? Uh, it could be being aggressive and we're not even paying attention. It could be strong focus on the negative and pessimism could be a poor attention span. There's a lot of these kind of things that a lot of times become our normal and we don't pay attention to them. You know, in his book, Compassion of Mind, uh, Dr. Paul Gilbert proposed that we have three main types of emotional regulation, regulation systems. And they work together, and a lot of times when they're not w working together the way they should, this causes that dysregulation. And the first system he talked about was the threat and self-protection system. That's the system that picks up threats and easily and it goes into self-protection mode, right? It uses, you know, if we look chemically, it uses adrenaline and cortisol to initiate a response. And the main emotions are anger, anxiety, and disgust. And so there's that threat, right, and self-protection uh, system. And then there's that incentive and resource-seeking system. This system motivates us toward an incentive and various resources in order to survive. For example, hunger, right? I mean, that's a good thing. We're hungry. Now what's it do? It incentivizes us, right, to conquer the hunger, and we start seeking resources, food, right? And, and so it can also be other things. Addictions work in that respect, right? And what happens, it uses dopamine. And we'll be talking a lot about uh, some of the uh, chemicals as we go on. Dopamine is one that just, it's that I gotta have it molecule that just creates this uh, strong urge to get whatever it's seeking after. And it's a chemical driver, right? And, and so uh, dopamine's the instigator, you might say, and the main emotional behaviors are wanting, pursuing, achieving, and consuming. Once we get it, you know, then there's that soothing, caring, and contentment system. And so that system helps us feel safe and content with the ways things are. And it uses oxytocin as its chemical driver. And the main emotions exhibited are contentment, safety, being connected, cared for, and trusted. Now that's, that's different than just a, a chemical high, right? Chemical high, it, it numbs us out. It, it gives us that false illusion uh, that we're okay, that we're safe, we're connected, we're cared for, but that's a false illusion. We're talking here about uh, uh, relationships and good things, uh, self-beliefs that are comforting to ourselves, things that bring us comfort, uh, meditation, uh, exercise, things that can help us uh, bring us down, give us that uh, feeling of contentment and safety. And so uh, when we loop between the threat self-protection system and the incentive, right? And so there's a threat going on and now, hey, I got to get out of here. You know, I want, I'm going to, you know, try to seek something to help me escape. That's when we get in trouble. And we talked about escapes last time, right? And this is a system that happens. We get that trouble going on, something alerts us. That's why it's so important to recognize it. Because what we want to do is we don't want to go after something negative, something that's just going to numb us out, something that becomes habitual and isn't healthy for us. We want to regulate it. 
we want to regulate it and we want to return to homeostasis we want to what all of a sudden come back to the soothing caring and contentment system right we want to come back and relax we want to meditate on good things and feel good and believe who we are uh, that God created us that we're lovable and significant and let that calm us down right and we want to break out of that loop and so how do we do that we examine what's triggering us are you keeping a journal are you keeping a journal perhaps of some of the emotional episodes that you're having Remember, be your own detective. You ever watch the, uh, the detective movies and, you know, the police come in and the one detective and they have what? The little pad and they're writing down notes, right? They're writing down notes so they can remember it later. Perhaps you need to do that. Keep, keep it, you know, a note of some of the emotion and ask yourself, what just triggered me? What was said? You know, what was the look on the person's face? What was the body language? What was the situation? What was I worried about? Those are things that you can think about and start to learn. And then we can examine it and say, is it faulty wiring? You know, am I believing a lie here? If so, it's faulty wiring. And we can expose the lies that are troubling us. You know, if they don't like me, I'm going to die. <laughs> well, that's a lie. You're not going to die if someone doesn't like you, right? Um, you're not going to die if you lose your job. Now, it won't be fun, I'm sure. But you see what I'm saying? So often we react as if we're going to die. And the truth is we're not. And we want to expose some of those lies. And we want to emotionally relearn the truth. And so, uh, the, you know, that tends to calm us down, that calms down the threat system and allows us to take advantage of the soothing, caring, contentment system through what? Acceptance, self-compassion, God's love for us, relational uh, people that are relational with us, that exhibit a love toward us, are happy to be with us. All those are legitimate ways of comforting ourselves. Well, we want to examine a little bit more. Here again, our goal isn't to be a neuroscience, but we scientist, but we want to look at the uh, autonomic nervous system. The anomic nervous system is part of that alarm system that we have. There's two parts, the sympathetic, which is the gas pedal that gets us to move, right? And then there's the parasympathetic, which we would call the brake, which uh, calms us back down. And so, you know, we have this alarm system. The thalamus scans for sensory input in trauma or under continuous stress. That amygdala, right? Remember our brain, <laughs> our hand model? Right in here is, you know, you got your amygdala and thalamus and you got the prefrontal cortex here. And so what happens is that, uh, you know, when something happens in trauma or stress, there's an implicit memory system tied to the amygdala and it looks then and says is this is this dangerous is this dangerous and perhaps it's you know recognizes things like facial expressions tone of voice proximity smell uh, and and sensations from similar events and then it sends a signal via the dorsal vagal nerve what to the sympathetic nervous system at, I like this, 265 miles an hour, that's pretty quick. <laughs> and, uh, you know, arriving in milliseconds through the bodies, inducing what? Fight or flight or freeze. And so a lot of times what happens, because these memories are implicit, it's hard to change, it's hard to become awareness, but we can, we can get to them. And there's ways, and we'll talk about that in later classes, but what we want to do then is start to find out, are those true? Because someone looks, looks at me that certain way, does that mean I'm no good and that I'm broken and I'm going to be in trouble? No. They could be looking that way for a lot of different things. And even if I was in trouble with them, I'm not going to die, right? And so we, we learn to regulate. We learn to change the meaning of what that look m means to us. It's exciting, exciting concepts. Now, Traditionally, we talk about three modes that we go into, fight, flight, and freeze. Fight is that frustrated, increasing agitation, anger, fury. Flight 
Does that worry, anxiety, overwhelmed, fear, withdrawal, or escaping, right? And, and so, you know, it can be that hypervigilance. Freeze is the third one. That's severe helplessness, numbness, overwhelmed, dissociate, shutdown, uh, immobility, preparation for death. I know in myself and the, the phobias and things I had like that as a child, I would freeze, I would faint, I would pass out, or I, and, or I would go into, you know, try to run from it sometimes. And each one of us have different modes that we, you know, uh, react to certain situations. Now, I added a fourth one, and I've added fix. And the reason I do that, it's similar to, to uh, fear and panic as flight, except there's no escape. Rather, instead of going that far to freeze in that, I learned myself to acquiesce, to people please, to fix the problem, right? By isolating or people pleasing or turning inward, you know, different ways, different ways to go ahead and solve the problem if I can. That's where codependency comes from, a lot of different things like that. And so um, a lot of times we become a people pleaser. We, we go around and we fix and we placate and we, uh, we try to fix the things. Now, what happens after the alarm response? The parasympathetic nervous system gets up and gets going again, right? Returning our systems to homeostasis. Your body contracts the pupils, uh, reactivates digestion, slows down the heartbeat, contracts the bladder, allows blood to flow to organs and the peripheral blood vessels. And so how do we do that? How do we deaccelerate that when we're finding that we're in a fight or flight? How do we go ahead and emotionally regulate some of that? Well, we accept that it's happening. We don't fight or ignore it. We rename it as faulty wiring. We acknowledge that we don't have to listen to it. We relax, breathe, and distract ourselves. We acknowledge, you know, the presence of God, put our faith in Him. Uh, we become our own observer if we need to. We ride the wave. That's so important. These emotions, they come up and they go down. I've helped so many people with panic attacks, right? Uh, using this similar method. And, and the last part of it is that you ride the wave. And you know what? It soon dissipates and you're retraining then that amygdala that, hey, maybe this wasn't dangerous to begin with. And you know, I, I put in that lesson on page three that that's similar to what we do with cravings. In a craving, you know, both, you know, our chemical reactions, both are triggered, both demand immediate action, and both can be deactivated doing those very things, right? And we can deactivate a trigger just like we do an emotional response. And so I encourage you to look at that. Now, you'll find on page four, I have a chart there, the anatomy of the alarm system, and you can see on the left side is the sympathetic nervous system. And, and there are some of the things that happen. So hopefully you can start to recognize, right? Remember, be your detective. This is emotional recognition. Eyes are dilating to increase focus, uh, loss of hearing, uh, release of adrenaline to prepare, right, for the muscular action. Heart beats faster and harder. Uh, lung function accelerates, causing tightness in the chest. You can read those and start saying and say, hmm, I want wonder if I've had some of those things. And these are clues to when your sympathetic nervous system is on and you're, you're getting ready to emotionally, you know, go into emotional dysregulation. Well, the parasympathetic nervous system, it can slow us down. It releases endorphin, numbs and raises, raises the pain threshold. The immune response shuts down, you know, and so you have some times where uh, the parasympathetic uh, can go too far and we freeze, other times we use it, what, to bring it, bring us back in. And so you can look at that. What we have here in the, in the chart is some of the, you know, when we go too far and we have the freeze uh, problem and you can see that symptoms include trepidation, panic, horror, dread. And so uh, it prevents us, you know, from feeling those things. Well, here's the good news. We can change a lot of the ways we react emotionally. We can change the dysregulation that's going on. We can change these things. 
because God has created our brain in a neuroplastic way that can be changed. It's malleable. We can change it, right? And Norman, uh, Dr. Norman Deutsch talks about the various types of dysregulation in his book, The Brain's Way of Healing. And I think you'll really enjoy that. If you want a good read about some of the exciting things that are going on with what seems to be impossible situations uh, in the brain and that it's it's just a great read and he talks about you know how we're able to uh, change things through neuroplasticity and Dr. Matwitz uh, and Golden who we referred to before in an earlier lesson they done uh, wrote a book on neuroplastic transformation and he says this neuroplastic transformation is a treatment that uses basic principles of neuroplasticity to change brain pathways back to normal function and anatomy to accomplish this we use thoughts images sensations memories soothing emotions movements and beliefs right to harness the power of our brains by learning this principle of how our brains work we can begin to use the conscious part of our brains to modify the experience of our lives and and you know uh, he wrote this many years after we had started this class but I like to include it because it, he says it exactly like it is we can use those things and as we go through this class, and that's why it's 50 weeks long, and I don't apologize for that, it takes time to change these things. And so each week as you come, you get reminded of these things. We start to put them in practice. The more we put them in practice, the more we change. And I've seen it over the 15 years I've been teaching this. Hundreds and hundreds of people, I've seen changes in people's lives because they practice these things. They do these things. And we'll use our thoughts, uh, we'll use our visualization and images, uh, we'll use the different sensations and comfort ourselves, uh, we'll work with our memories, and we'll, we'll use different, our, our beliefs, we'll change our beliefs. And as we do, as we do, God will start to heal those things. And you know, talking about God and His presence in our life and how our belief in God can change us, Dr. Carolyn Leaf, uh, who's a neuroscientist, a Christian, in her uh, Detox Your Mind program that I was listening to, shared about how communication with God works with our brain. And according to her, she says, when we thank God, and you know, they did, they did different brain scans, when we thank God, the limbic system, that the emotional part, the limbic starts lighting up with anticipation. The brain starts to prepare for change. And when we praise God, and so the first part is thanking God. When we praise God, that, that cortex, the neocortex, the more rational part of the brain lights up, getting us ready for change. And when we worship, this was significant, the whole brain lights up, helping us make the changes we need. So thanking God, praising Him, worship, worshiping Him can allow us to activate the parasympathetic nervous system to calm us down. Isn't that exciting? And so we can allow God to help us get out of this dysregulation. And so try it this week. If you're starting to get stressed, stop. Quickly thank God for what is going on, that, that He's there, He's present with you. Praise Him that He's there, that He'll help you. Worship Him as the all-knowing, all-loving God who promises that He'll never leave you or forsake you. Worship Him because He promises to help you experience His peace, right, which exceeds anything we can understand. The Bible promises that His peace will guard our hearts and minds as we live in Christ Jesus. And so as we do that, we'll start seeing that God can help us with some of this neuroplastic transformation. And so again, as we use thoughts, beliefs, images, work with our memories, as we do these things, as we continue in this program, we're going to see God start to help us with this dysregulation. We're going to see God start to make the changes in our lives that we long for. We'll start to believe the things that God believes about us, that we're lovable, that we're significant, that we have a purpose, and that we're safe, and that we belong to Him. And I pray that God would help each one of us in this class 
to regulate our emotions and to live the kind of life with the fruit of the Spirit, right? The love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control that he intends us to. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you next time.